All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's glad to see some people actually showed up after this morning's content. I can understand uh, uh, you might have wanted to take the afternoon off, but uh, good job, Governor. Uh, at any rate, <laughs> uh, we're going to follow the same format this afternoon that we fo uh, followed this morning, which it'll be a joint committee um, set of presentations with myself uh, as head of the technology committee and Jeff Johnson as head of the consultation committee. And we'll go through the minutes and, and uh, do the necessary formalities and then jump into uh, various presentations with the group. But uh, prior to sort of kicking things off, one of the things I, I did, uh, we, we had a little bit of a longer lunch in the sense that we uh, got some time upstairs in the, uh, in the new facility. And I must say it was a very uh, impressive office. Uh, not too impressive, uh, but, uh, but, but, but certainly looked very functional and very open and collaborative, which I think is consistent with the core values that, uh, that TJ went over uh, earlier today. So it looked like great space and looked like uh, productive space as there was a good bit of, uh, of activity up there. So I don't know if anyone else has any observations they'd like to, to share about the, about the office tour. Um, if, if not, we'll, uh, we'll jump right in. Um, so let's get, uh, let's get started. I guess the, the first thing on my committee, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to the Technology Committee uh, meeting. And I'd also like to welcome our newest Technology Committee addition, uh, Neil Cox. Neil has a tremendous amount of experience in the wireless industry and the security industry and uh, sort of big scale uh, type operations. And we're delighted to have him not only join the board, but join our committee. So Neil, welcome and thank you very much. Look forward to your contributions going forward. Um, with that, I guess we need to go ahead and call the technology committee roll. Uh, so Azama, would you jump through that process? Absolutely. Please uh, turn on your mic and say here. Barry Boniface. Here. Kevin McGinnis. Here. Ed Reynolds. Here. Suzanne Spalding. Here. Chris Burbank. Here. Neil Cox. Here. We have a quorum. Terrific. Uh, glad to see everybody was here and able to uh, participate. Uh, I guess the next order of business is to uh, accept the minutes. I think each of you have had a chance to look at the minutes from the last meeting. Uh, I don't know if anybody had any additions or corrections or other adjustments that they would like to suggest with respect to those minutes. If not, uh, I would take a, a, a motion to accept the minutes. I so move. Any second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are accepted. So with that, I think it's now my turn to turn over uh, the meeting to Jeff um, so he can do the same thing. And I think before that, Ozama's gonna read the conflicts notification. So, Ozama. In advance of first net October 2015 committee and board meetings, <coughs> The management team has provided the board with an agenda outlining each of the items that will be discussed and decided during the meetings. The members were also provided with a conflict of interest assessment, which was produced jointly by the Commerce Department Office of General Counsel and FirstNet's Office of Chief Counsel. Providing these documents in advance to the board members allows them to identify potential conflicts of interest and to recuse themselves from participation if required. We will, prior, prior to this meeting um, and prior to the board meeting, remind the members of their obligations related to conflicts of interest. In consideration of the joint meeting day, each member should consider his or her obligations with respect to the appropriate committee, and for some of you, that means both committee meetings that are taking place now. With that said, if there's any board members that believe they must now recuse themselves from one or both of these meetings, please so state for the record. Hearing no, no one make any um, mention, I think we're, pre we're prepared to proceed. Thank you, Zama. Um, this will open the committee meeting for the Outreach and Consultation Committee, and our first item of business will be uh, the review, approval, and or amendments of the minutes. 
the, the chair to entertain a motion to approve or amend the minutes? So moved. I have a motion from the mayor. Second. And a second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Any abstentions? What was that? Okay. Uh, Uzama, would you uh, complete the roll, please? Jeff Johnson? Here. Kevin McGinnis? Here. Terry Takai? Here. Suzanne Spaulding? Here. Ron Davis? Here. <laughs> Perfect. Jim Douglas? Here. Aeneas Parker? Here. And Richard Stanick? Here. Thank you, Uzama. We must have had a quorum for that motion, correct? We do. Excellent. Uh, Barry, I think it's back to you. As you can see, Jeff and I are having a little trouble with this new format, but we'll work it out. <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, the first item on our agenda is to uh, hear from our acting CTO, Jeff Bratcher. Jeff is going to give us an update on the activities of our technology group. So, Jeff, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll wait for the slides to show up here. Clicker is working. Hello. There we go. Clicking it. There we go. Glad to be here. Thanks again. I uh, want to give a few updates since our last meeting in June in San Diego under much better weather circumstances, I might add. Uh, but we've got a few things I wanted to cover today, uh, go through some of our new hiring, uh, the RFP work that we've been focused on, the tech committee briefings, uh, some of the early builder updates, and uh, some updates from our partners at PSCR. So quickly on the hiring update, so I'm pleased to announce we have hired a director of standards development for FirstNet. His name's Dean Prohaska. Uh, he's getting up to speed quickly, but he actually has a long career in standards development and actually uh, helped develop the uh, global technology standards body at Sprint's uh, wireless and wireline businesses. So most recently, he was with NIST in their smart grid uh, conformance and uh, the cyber physical systems uh, at NIST working on the standards there. We're pleased to have Dean. Uh, he was at the 3GPP plenary meetings a couple of weeks ago in Phoenix, Arizona and has rekindled old friendships from when he was leading standards and uh, is making an impact now, and also uh, leveraging our standard support team at PSCR. So glad to have Dean on board. So quick update on our office. Uh, you saw the new Reston facilities upstairs. Um, we have 28 staff on site now out in Boulder. Uh, we have room to grow as well. It's been an open cube based design similar to what you see upstairs from the beginning, uh, but since there was funding remaining from the uh, uh, build out upstairs, we're going to leverage that excess funding and monitor the same style cubes and everything are going to be implemented out in Boulder to match the decor and uh, the way they've uh, had it a little more open than what we have out in Boulder. Uh, that building was uh, several years old and, and the equipment's a little outdated. Uh, we currently have 14 federal employees out in Boulder, nine contractors. We also have uh, two of the IT staff from our CIO team are out there, as well as the program management office has two federal employees. So it's really a, a, a across the board first net uh, office. It's not just related and not solely for the technical team. Um, giving some highlights of our staff that are coming on board now and also into the future through April of 2016. 90% of the technical staff have at least five years or more private sector wireless industry experience. 22% uh, of them are military vets representing all branches of service, so that's a, a great benefit to us as well. Direct public safety experience with two of our technical staff. One is a search and volunteer rescue uh, on, the, on, the, on his off time, in his fun time, I should say. And uh, one has military experience uh, on the military police side. Um, our facility is approximately 28,000 square feet. We've got about half of that in office space. The other half is warehouse and our future lab space that was mentioned earlier this morning. We're implementing that uh, lab build out now in anticipation of our RFP activities and operations and validation that we'll have to do in the future. Um, I wanted to switch topics a little bit and discuss what we've been doing uh, RFP related since we met last June. 
So uh, as we released the draft RFP, we also solicited questions and comments from industry and public safety in the states on the draft RFP documents. So the teams really buckled down and focused over the summer to do a detailed analysis and categorization of all those questions and comments that we received, as well as the capability statements from the special notice and draft RFP. There were lots of long days and very late nights across the teams that were comprised of not just the technical office, but also the financial office, our user advocacy off, uh, teams, as well as uh, some of our uh, other key areas within the, the IT and network operations facilities. We posted all the answers to these questions publicly on the Federal Business Opportunities website. If no one, if you haven't had a chance to look at that, you can actually see all the questions submitted as well as the answers that we've developed. We also did a deep dive on all the comments and questions that were received. I've got a few graphs coming up that'll help explain uh, the, the questions and where those came from and who asked them. So this gives an overview of the questions by area. So we grouped a lot of the technical ones together. Those are obviously the biggest portion of the questions that we received. Uh, next one up would be the contract itself and how that'll be structured and a lot of questions pertaining to that moving forward. Uh, we pulled coverage out as its own uh, block because we did get quite a few questions around coverage. That's, you know, for public safety, the, the proof in the pudding, where's the coverage gonna be, where am I gonna have service? So we pulled that one out separately. The next slide gives a breakdown by area uh, where we f uh, focused a lot of the answers and how they were div divvied up across the, all the technical areas as well as the rest of them. Some of the key points to show, as I mentioned earlier, coverage, we had 78 questions just and comments just on coverage alone. The, the next in line would be the network and then following that was the contract. What was a little surprising to us is applications was the fourth right after that. In thinking and reflecting on it, we realize this is a broadband data network, so applications would, should rise to the top four, and that's, that's what happened. The next slide shows by area. So this is industry versus states and public safety. So industry is represented in blue, and that indicates the quantity of questions we receive from industry across the different areas. It's kind of an eye chart, but these will be available on the slides on the website. And then the orange is the states and public safety. So uh, analyzing some of this a bit, the top percentage of questions from industry were related to the user pricing and the logistics and format of the acquisition and the overall network and how that would uh, be procured by FirstNet. In contrast, the top percentage of questions from the states and public safety really focused on the operation of the network and the life cycle plans on the technology to ensure this network will stay uh, current with capabilities as LTE advances and wireless technologies advance. We didn't find these very surprising and it confirms what we've been hearing in our market research meetings with industry and also from our outreach and consultation team what they've been hearing during their uh, fantastic efforts in talking with all the states. So I thought that was, that was good to highlight for what we've been an analyzing and all that's gonna be developed and rolled into the final RFP as that comes out later this year. So switching gears, I'd like to talk about our uh, briefing we held with yourself, Mr. Chairman, and two of the new board members and our new CEO, Mike Poth, out in Boulder, Colorado on September 9th. We were very honored to have you guys out there and, and take you, uh, not only spend a very busy day at our office and overwhelmed you with information, I'm sure, but also took you over to the labs and were able to see actual activities. And I think I forgot Chairman, Vice Chairman Johnson was there as well, uh, asking some great questions. So the demos you saw were related to band 14 and some of those demos involved quality of service, priority and preemption, some of the local control concepts and challenges for that implementation, some multi-band device approaches, band 14 and, and including other bands as well. Deployables like you see in the picture here, the cell on wheels that uh, PSER has and all the different uh, players that they have on that cell on wheels and how they use that. And some of the audio, audio quality research related to upcoming broadband voice coders that are slated to be used with LTE and mission critical push to talk in the future. But Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to pause here for a few minutes and maybe we open it up for uh, yourself and Vice Chair Johnson and uh, Mr. Cox and Mr. Horowitz for what you took away, what, what impressed upon you with the uh, visit out to Boulder. Terrific. Well, I, I'll, I'll start, but, but probably we'll, we'll yield to the others to provide more of their, their reactions. But listen, I, I've been out there now a couple times, I think, 
I'm always impressed with the quality of people that we have around the project from a technical perspective. I mean, the depth and background of the people doing the work in the functional areas is very, very impressive. And um, I also was taken by the mapping of all the functions that uh, are necessary to ultimately deliver the network. And I'm sure that's only a subset of what's, right. what's ultimately required, but the thought associated with who's going to do what and how it's all going to come together. Uh, clearly, there's been a ton, a ton of work done in that area. And um, I found, you know, I always find it enlightening. I find it encouraging. Uh, and I think that um, you got a great team and the folks at PSCR are doing some very important work for us. And, and the way you guys are working together, I think, is, is phenomenal. So from my perspective, it was a very productive day. Uh, Jeff, I don't know if you've one of the things that struck me uh, when I was a fire chief after September 11th was the wide array of people that left much higher paying professions to become a firefighter. We had attorneys and doctors and we had all sorts of professionals that were earning multiples of a firefighter salary, but they all left it because they won they wanted to do good for their country, and they wanted to be in public service. And that was, my, that was my lasting thought as I left the lab. I was struck by the people who obviously could be making multiples of their salary at any job for a carrier or wireless manufacturer, whatever, and they were all passionate about why they were there, and they were all there for the same reason, is they wanted to use their skills to enhance public safety. It was really impressive. I think culturally, uh, you know, what you and Derek and Tracy and the team have built out there, um, whatever you're doing, keep doing it, because you've attracted some profoundly high-quality people that are working on the right kinds of things. No ego, it's all about public safety. So hats off to you culturally. I'll defer to the... Yeah, this is uh, Neil Cox. Um, I was very impressed. I mean, going there for the first time and seeing what you've built. Um, what impressed me is something that, that still sticks with me in, in having built networks like this in the past, of how you've involved the people, your clients, your, your user group. Uh, what struck me was how you've taken and mapped the country and how you got that input from the users and let them determine you know, which groups, which square miles need to be hardened. So it was some very impressive of how, you, how you're starting to build this thing from the bottom up, not from the top down. And by involving this, you know, our clients in this very, very critical network, it's amazing how you've done that, Jeff, and that be able to map those 56 locations to get down to every square mile what needs to happen still sticks with me today on what you've done there. And I echo what, what Barry and Jeff said about the whole team out there. It's a phenomenal team, lots of skill sets, a lot of experience. So you have a tremendous amount of experience in this. And, uh, but just the way you've involved you know, our future users of this network and how they made that input is very, very critical to what you're doing. Great. Thanks, Neil. Uh, this is Ed Horowitz. Um, I, I, obviously, I. I uh, wholeheartedly agree with the caliber of individuals that you brought on board and kind of the core team that, that you've put together. Um, in particular, the, the fact that you've got individuals that co have come from industry, that have come from the, cons from the customer environment, uh, that also have an, a feel for what kind of resilience and security is going to be required and um, uh, how to hand off uh, networks. Uh, but between uh, you know a crisis situation where you've got to capture all the all the bandwidth and uh, when you can turn it back into a commercial area, and also then the thought process that's gone into the development of the RFI slash P uh, draft, and then subsequently you just went through the breakdown of the questions and who asked what, and um, and all of that talk really results in rigor, professionalism. And uh, I think when all is said and done, when this RFP is put on the street, it, there will be few surprises to anyone in the technical community. Great. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate the feedback. And I, I can't go any further without saying my colleagues sitting here at the table do a lot of that heavy lifting with our customer outreach, with the state consultations, and they're on the road a lot more than I am. So uh, I, I think it, it shows sometimes. <laughs> so uh, can't, it's a, definitely a team effort across all the areas at FirstNet. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Great. Thank you for the feedback. So I'd like to move on to the uh, an update on our Oh, wrong button again, to the early builder projects. So as most of you, I think, are aware, uh, the four of these projects are funded through the BTOP program, and that program, as of yesterday at midnight, completed its uh, efforts for funding the four projects. Two of them did get an extension, and I'll go into that in, in some of the, the background here. One thing I'd like to start off by saying is thanks to Lynn Bashaw, my team, and his support team that are actually out in these projects. We have boots on the ground in all five of these, helping in any shape or form we can from technical aspects to project management aspects. And the teams develop some great relationships with all of the uh, uh, players in the different markets in the different cities that are working on these systems. Uh, the, the LA RICs I'll start off with, um, they are at 77 sites, 15 of those are cell on wheels. They have an additional microwave repeater site. Uh, they plan to be operational by the end of this ca uh, calendar year, December 31st, as they finish up their final sites and uh, backhaul and power is completed. It was one of the two that did get an extension until December 31st to finish their construction activities. Uh, the state of New Mexico, the project's been issued another, it's the other grant extension until December 31st to close out some of the training and the build and optimization of the last remaining site that they have for their network. The, their band 14 cell on wheels was actually used in support of the New Mexico State Fair last month uh, with great accolades from the state police and also uh, was covered by two of the local TV news broadcasts. Uh, the Cell on Wheels is also going to be supporting the upcoming New Mexico Balloon Fiesta. It's one of the, I think, the largest in the United States. New Mexico is my hometown, and we always get plugs for the Balloon Fiesta. So that's coming up, uh, I believe, next week, and they're going to have significant public safety involvement and press coverage for that as well. Look forward to hearing the outcomes there. Moving on to New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey includes the Route 21 Camden and Atlantic City areas for their deployables-based system. They've also got uh, 29 of those in, in operation now. They also have a van and an SUV, bringing the total assets to around 37. They've completed their grant program successfully, and now they're going to start moving into training and operational readiness. Uh, the state and local users will be brought on in late fourth quarter and early first quarter of next year. They also successfully supported the Papal visit uh, last week in Philadelphia, uh, leveraging uh, Band 14 uh, STA that uh, we agreed to with the FCC to use that. Uh, lots of uh, fantastic feedback. Fred Scalera actually gave an uh, excellent webinar on UrgentCom yesterday regarding that and how they used it for the events that transpired. Uh, again, with big uh, venues like that and big events, the uh, commercial networks were heavily congested with everyone doing their social media, uh, Twitter and p Facebook posting and pictures. The Band 14 was running wide open. They had uh, several different applications that the uh, teams were able to use and leverage during those times. Adams County, Colorado, they have 16 sites on air and they're actually under construction with their uh, three sites that'll be at the Denver airport. Uh, so those will be uh, wrapping up later this year, and they're working to activate and test those sites soon with uh, uh, temporary power. State of Texas and Harris County, they currently have 19 sites on air. Uh, they've been up and running for quite a while, but they uh, most recently received an influx of funding from the county, $5.8 million, to enhance and add additional sites to this uh, system uh, and uh, really fill in some of those coverage areas. Key things we're learning with them are some of the data analytics and uh, recent updates on their system enable daily system performance logging. So we're getting a lot more detailed data around the performance and usage of this system by the users that they have out there, which is uh, fantastic and we're leveraging a lot of this as we start developing some of our network policies and operation plans for the, the nationwide network. One thing I like to highlight with the early builders, um, we do have key 
learning plans that are part of the spectrum management lease agreement. But in addition to that, we've also been documenting uh, hundreds of informal key lessons as we've been participating in these projects. And we've been logging these and tracking these and using them in our RFP development as well. You'll see some of the breakdown there. A lot of those are coming out of New Jersey with their deployables-based system. We're learning a lot on how to use deployable and satellite backhaul for LTE. Uh, New Jersey and Texas, widest breadth. Uh, Texas has a, a large system on air now. They're using it for a bunch of unique capabilities. And LA, uh, obviously, with the public safety assets that they're leveraging for their existing sites, lessons learned allow, around how that can be used and, and leveraged in the future for our network. And uh, we expect the informal lessons to reduce as we start focusing now on the key learning conditions, which has me excited because now they're moving in all five into a much more operational phase. We'll start hearing a lot more out of these projects and what they're actually using Band 14 for. Moving into some of the NIST and PSCR updates. So one thing that the law that created FirstNet also put in there was a a pool of money for research and development for public safety broadband requirements. Uh, it's 100 to $300 million, depending how the uh, proceeds work. Uh, the first bucket was $100 million, then there was another $200 million bucket based on auction proceeds. So that's really focused in the legislation. They call out two critical areas for them to work on, and that's mission critical voice over LTE and land mobile radio to LTE integration. So they know from the get-go they'll be using this funding for those two efforts as they move forward. And that the first hundred million, it should be uh, in their account since we did not have a shutdown, hopefully this, this month in the, in the first couple of weeks. Now, in addition to that, they knew they had a lot more funding than just focus on those two areas. So there was actually a workshop kicked off back, and I believe TJ actually gave the keynote at this workshop back in November of 2013, to pull together the stakeholders from public safety, what would you like to see in broadband as we move forward on research and development with this, with this pot of money. And some of the areas that came out of those uh, workshops were location-based services, uh, and that actually had, they have their summit coming up uh, later this month at Boulder, uh, and we'll be participating as well as several others. And this is really focused on the public safety requirements of location-based services, really the Z axis and how we can get better uh, granularity on locating assets and firefighters in buildings, and, and that's what they're really gonna be pushing some of this uh, funding with data analytics, and then device usability and user interface. That's some of the, the other three key, two key areas that they're focused some of the initial funding on. And they're actually working closely with us, as spelled out in the legislation, to drive those critical areas. If there's, as we move down the line, as we see areas we need to have them focus on, we can uh, ping uh, Derek and the team there, and they will uh, dedicate efforts to those areas. Quick standards update I like to provide. So release 13 is almost done. Uh, it's scheduled to be finished up here in March of 2016. Uh, we were able to get some extensions uh, for the mission critical push to talk capabilities that are really critical in release 13 that we wanted to have done so that the vendor community can start developing those products. It's really uh, not only important for the FirstNet network but also for our international partners in the United Kingdom and South Korea that have much more aggressive schedules for some of their broadband efforts. So uh, we're working closely with them. We're, we're project leaders for several of the work items within 3GPP, and uh, Dean, our new Director of Standards, is helping strategize Release 14. Uh, one thing that's coming up in Release 14 is mission critical video. So there's actually an effort underway from uh, not only the U.S. but other countries on defining some standards for mission critical video. One thing I'd like to highlight is Bill Schreier recently sent to most of the technical team, he's a Spock for the state of Washington, a video from the wildland fires in Washington. And what's amazing on the video is you see all the firefighters pulling out their phones to film what's going on and try and send that back on uh, usually congested networks. But the key to that is that video being uh, readable and understandable by whoever they need to send it to, to understand the different uh, uh, areas of the fire and what's happening. So I'm really pleased to see 3GPP is, is focused on public safety. One of the uh, research organizations puts out uh, recaps of the releases, and this is one by 4G Americas, that the second bullet in here is public safety focused for release 13 and release 14 coming up. So it's really uh, driving it from a worldwide perspective with our international partners and uh, developing these standards up front so that when the networks mature, we'll hit that. Jeff, and 
I'm, it's probably obvious to everybody but me, but this is important, right, that we get involved in the 3GPP process so that, what, we have access to a broader array of commercial devices, Absolutely. holds the cost down. I mean, what are some of those reasons? Absolutely. Quantities of scale for, you know, standards-based allows uh, level playing fields, a lot more entrance to that if you have a standards-based uh, solution. Uh, and it also drives in some of the unique requirements into these standards, whereas in, in other technologies and other markets, some of those requirements oftentimes are proprietary. So that leads to uh, higher cost and, and those capabilities. But the great thing with 3GPP and LTE, since it's been chosen as the global platform for wireless broadband data, not just for public safety, but honestly for the worldwide commercial cellular market, public safety gets to ride that wave. We've got uh, the inroads now in the committees to help ensure the public safety requirements for some of these technologies are built in up front. Uh, the, big, the big key will be at the end, once the releases are finalized, then the vendors will pick those up and start developing products for them. And then just to wrap up a couple of slides on what we have the, uh, the teams working on out at PSCR for us, that some of the demos you saw included these uh, test and evaluation areas, uh, cell barring, some of the different ways we can get secondary users off the spectrum, focus it only on our priority users, some of the preemption capabilities, and adjusting priorities on the fly as incidents change, uh, and seeing some of those initial concepts on how that could potentially be done. Also working on some of the future aspects, uh, uh, next slide, local quality of service priority and preemption, dynamic, the end-to-end, -end, and uh, some of the uh, mobile device areas. So secure container technologies, how can you have a BYOD device that is first net and also personal, for instance. Uh, they're going to work on, on that for us. One thing I'd like to highlight on this slide, so at the last meeting we had an update about the mobile communications unit, the MCU, with the PSAC committee. So I was fortunate we had an executive committee meeting yesterday with the PSAC, and we've been, we received several uh, comments and questions on the draft RFP that MCU is actually in uh, a term within the incident command system that was causing confusion because it is a dedicated roll-up, deployable, only COM-based facility. So we needed a different term for MCU for what we envision as MCU, and that's the, uh, the, the, the term that the executive committee chose, we threw out several different alternatives, is the vehic vehicular network system. So this is really uh, an add-on to an existing fire truck, police car, ambulance to add band 14 capabilities to that. It's not its primary focus to be a band 14 device, it's to add to the additional capabilities. So I thought that was a good compromise. There was uh, lots of other names that came out, I probably can't repeat here, but uh, that, that one we, we settled on and uh, that, that won the day. Could we call that the VNS? VNS. Yeah, that's, nice. Yes. Excellent. So uh, we'll be updating our blog post and some of the other things that we've put out related to that and that'll be rolling into our final RFP. And with that, Mr. Chairman, um, I think that's the last slide, and I'll turn it over to Amanda, unless there are any other questions for me. Any other questions on these topics? Great. Chief, would you like to introduce your squad there? I would. Thank you very much. So at this time, the Outreach and Consultation Committee, you have the pleasure of hearing from Amanda Hilliard and Dave Buchanan who will give us an update on uh, the work we've been doing in outreach and consultation. Congratulations to the two of you. Uh, you know, a little bit of work here. 56 states, commonwealths, and territories. 52 down, four to go. Congratulations. The floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Chief, and I'm glad you, you said that we. I know that uh, all our public safety board members in particular have been really active helping with our our outreach efforts as well as some of the other board members. So I'm going to start off um, like I normally do, just provide a couple of updates on um, the outreach engagements that we've had since our, our last meeting in June. And I'll, I'll focus a little bit on, on what's ahead in particular, our upcoming uh, state and territory single point of contact or SPOC meeting and our, our work with the Public Safety Advisory Committee. And then of course uh, uh, Dave will move into the update on the state consultation meetings and, and preview some of the plans we have for the coming year. So in terms of uh, recent stakeholder events, we've held a number of significant well-attended events over the last couple of months, um, in addition to the state consultation meetings and you know, many of the other organizational meetings that we participated in that you see here on the slide. We held our July SPOC webinar um, with 
uh, most of the states participating in that. Um, of course, everyone's aware of Industry Day that was held at the end of August there and the, the great um, participation we had in that event. Uh, following Industry Day, that the next day we held a, a webinar um, just for our SPOCs, our PSAC members, our federal agency points of contact, as well as our tribal working group members. Um, to reiterate some of the messaging from Industry Day, you know, focus it a little more toward them versus our industry stakeholders and allow the opportunity for them to, to ask some additional questions. So um, considering we held that on a Friday afternoon, I think 120 attendees on that webinar was, was um, showed you, again, the, the interest that the community has on everything that we're doing. Um, we held a Public Safety Advisory Committee webinar in late um, September that, that Chief McEwen ran. I know a number of board members participated on that as well. We've been holding those webinars um, in between the, the twice a year PSAC meetings um, to keep the, the full committee engaged and apprised of, of the, all the work that's going on within the task teams and the working groups. Um, and then as Jeff had alluded to, we, we met with uh, four of the five PSAC Executive Committee members uh, yesterday for, for a full day, probably could have gone another day and are pleased that we still have um, Chief McEwen and, and Tom Sorley, our uh, local representative, here with us today. Um, so these events were, were primarily used to continue to, to socialize our data collection effort, um, encourage you know, broad participation in that effort, of course talk about the draft RFP documents and some of the feedback that we got, um, as well as the public notice process. And I would just note, um, in addition, of course, to, to these events that we, we hosted, we continue to send out our weekly um, emails to our, our SPOCs, our federal agency POCs, and the, the PSAC and tribal working group members, um, just to, get, to make sure they're apprised of any new resources we've been putting out on our websites, announcements, um, summary of the recent press clippings, and all the events we're participating in. So um, I think that's been really helpful, and kudos again to our comms team who, who helps to compile a lot of that information. Um, the comms team has also been working with the, the public safety board members on some additional monthly um, discipline specific message uh, that, that we're going to continue to do to get the word out and have a more focused message to our different you know, EMS, fire, law enforcement audiences. So I mentioned um, we've done a, a number of events, of we, the collective we, board members, you know, various first net management, senior leadership and staff over 100 events just over the last couple of months here since the June meeting, and you, you see a sampling of some of those events here um, highlighted on the slide. And just to highlight a few, um, the APCO annual conference, uh, many of us participated in, in August. Um, really great to work with APCO. We had eight sessions there focused on a number of different topics, FirstNet and Next Generation 911, um, acquisition, consultation, data collection, and state plans. Um, great to see a number of our SPOCs there attending that, that conference that full week, as well as our, our PSAC members and the Early Builder Projects also had a really great panel. Um, in terms of the fire service, I know the IAFC, the, the Fire Chiefs Conference, was at the end of August, uh, and Vicki and, and Chief Johnson did a great job at, at that conference. Um, I think Vicki said spoke to nine committees and sections during that week, so again, just getting the message out. Not only you know, speaking at panel sessions or keynotes, but, but meeting with a lot of those individual committees. And I know that uh, Josh Edeheimer, our senior law enforcement advisor, has been working closely with um, Chief Burbank and, and Sheriff Stanek um, to, to do the same on the, the law enforcement side. And we've got our IACP, our Chief, uh, Police Chiefs Conference, coming up later this month. And again, a full schedule there, there with a number of uh, committee meetings that we'll be speaking at as well. Um, on the EMS side, Kevin's been busy traveling, getting in some miles as well, um, attending both national and, and some state events, um, similar to what we're doing on the law enforcement side. And then last, I wanted to just mention on, on the tribal front, um, just to highlight one event there, Carl Rebstock, our, our tribal lead, um, participated in the National Joint Tribal Emergency Management Conference in August. Uh, we had one session there, again, focused primarily on data collection and encouraging the tribes to work with, with their SPOCs to participate in that effort. Um, there was a second session related to FirstNet that our SPOCs or um, contacts from Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Texas, and Washington participated in. So a go good joint effort there. Um, our tribal working group members have been helping to, to kind of help with some of our outreach and participating in some of these tribal events as well. So that's going really well. I also just wanted to, to briefly mention on the hiring front, I don't have any um, official announcements yet, but we've hired a couple of additional staff that will be coming on board in the next month. 
Um, I'm pleased to announce we've hired SMEs or senior advisors similar to the role Josh has been doing on the law enforcement side. Um, our EMS senior advisor starts next week, our fire advisor uh, in mid-October, and then we've also made a selection for a 911 advisor. So really excited to bring that, those um, staff on board and to help further you know, build out our strategies to, and um, outreach materials to engage with, with those important communities. Um, so you'll be hearing more in, from us and engaging with those folks as we move forward. Um, we've also hired two additional staff to support our tribal outreach and engagement. Um, both are tribal members, so we're, we're looking forward to having them um, start in mid-October. And I wanted to thank uh, Kevin McGinnis for participating in that, those interviews with us and, and helping us. And I think he'll be helping us with some of the onboarding as well. <laughs> So we are looking forward to, to growing the team and being able to support you know, even more engagements as we move forward. Um, shifting gears, I wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about our upcoming uh, SPOC meeting. So uh, you'll probably recall back in April, we held our first um, SPOC meeting. It went really well. Um, so I think I said at the last committee meeting, about two hours into the meeting, TJ wanted to know when we were doing it again. So we, we scheduled our, our second meeting, which will occur next week in Westminster, Colorado. Um, we, have over, we have 52 of the states and territories registered, over 130 um, attendees. So once again, we're expecting a really good um, turnout for that meeting. We've also invited the PSAC Executive Committee members to attend, uh, Chief McEwen and, and two other members will be attending that. Um, and similar to the April meeting, we also invited our tribal working group members to participate. Comments? Yeah, um, I would like to make a comment. Uh, Governor Douglas and I attended that meeting um, and I, Jim, I know what you have to say, but I came away with a lot more information than I went into it with, and it was really, really valuable to hear the SPOCs um, react to our plans and to know that they're not all necessarily um, speaking with the same voice. The different states obviously have different um, priorities, um, but it was just incredibly important um, to have been there, um, just in my understanding of where we're headed and how it may differ with the understanding of a lot of other people out there. And so I found it very valuable. I also had, um, uh, because of my tribal interest uh, and the opportunity we had there, that was also very constructive. But I, I would really like to encourage board members to attend, um, if not this upcoming SPOC meeting, uh, a future SPOC meeting for just that purpose. It is invaluable. Amen. Uh, it was great to uh, learn a lot personally and to see the interaction among the SPOCs. Um, as Kevin noted, uh, they aren't all of the same mind on every issue, but that's okay. Uh, it's a diverse country. Um, we want to make sure everybody has his or her ideas on the table, and uh, I thought a lot of the discussions were quite constructive. So I'm glad uh, TJ insisted on another one. And, uh, <laughs> You may not be Amanda, but uh, uh, no, we are. That was in the plans. Maybe I think, not. I think it's a it's a great uh, convening of our partners. Good, and we're pleased that you both will be joining us again next week, as well as um, Chief Johnson, Sheriff Stanick, and Neil Cox. I know is coming out as well. So looking forward to having you all um, participate. You know, on, on that note, it was only a couple hours into it, and I think I was uh, kind of in the back corner with Kevin and and and, and the governor, and we. It was amazing the interaction and the questions and the diversity of discussion. And what was great is it wasn't just FirstNet and, and the single point of contacts discussing, it was everybody discussing with each other. And, you know, an issue in New Jersey versus an issue in Nevada, and just how does that, that kind of issue play out. And that kind of discussion I thought was so important for each other to hear, because I think everybody comes to a different perspective to that kind of discussion. And, and so Amanda's right, it was, you know, she was barely through her first session and I was asking her to schedule the next one. So uh, these take a lot of work, there's a lot of coordination, so I just want to thank the entire team that, that's putting together next week's session. Um, you know, there's a lot of coordination to get the right people together and to get all the travel squared away, and I just really think it's invaluable. Great. Um, so we're looking forward to, again, that meeting will be in Westminster, Colorado next week. Um, which makes it nice for much of uh, Jeff's team to, to join as well. So we're, we're looking forward to having much of the user advocacy team, our CTO team, and a few other staff there to participate. Um, this slide here shows you a number of different topics that we plan to, to cover throughout the two days. We've got a really packed agenda. I think one of our primary goals um, with the SPOCs is to um, talk a little bit about our plans ahead for 2016 in terms of state consultation, in terms of, of outreach and state planning activities. So we're looking forward to 
um, kind of previewing some of our, our plans and have a lot of opportunity for discussion and, and dialogue and get their input on that. So again, this, this slide here, um, much like the meeting we did in April, we've got two full days. Um, the first day we're going to spend much of the day as a, a group and talk about um, our, our plans again for consultation, for state plans. Uh, Jeff's team is going to do a, a panel as well to talk about some of their priorities um, from the technical side for the upcoming year. And then the second day, like we did back in uh, April, we're going to have a number of concurrent um, breakout sessions going on at a time so that we can cover a broad range of, of topics throughout the day and, and the attendees can kind of self-select which ones are of most interest to them. Um, I would note again, each state is allowed to bring up to three attendees per state or territory. So you can see here, um, we've got the early builder projects teed up um, to, on a panel to talk about some of their lessons learned. We'll do another session on tribal engagement. Um, Ed and his team are pulling together a session on uh, governor and elected official engagement. Um, we've got a session that Chris Algier is planning on, on federal engagement, um, as well as uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the operational architecture and just you know, general education and outreach. Um, Tracy McElvaney from PSCR is also going to join us and, and talk about the work they're doing on priority and preemption. So we're really looking forward to um, next week and, and a lot of engagement with the, the community. Um, so shifting gears then, I just wanted to talk very briefly about our work with the Public Safety Advisory Committee, and I know that uh, Chief McEwen will be um, briefly um, briefing the, the full board tomorrow. Um, but as I mentioned, we had a, a good day with the Executive Committee yesterday. Um, a number of the, the different staff from User Advocacy and again from Jeff's team um, met with them to talk about some of our plans for the coming year. Uh, the technical team also met with them to talk about the task team work that's been going on around priority and preemption. Um, Jeff talked a little bit about the devices work and public safety grade and kind of wrapping up those initial assignments um, that we had given them, I think, at the beginning of the year. So a lot of good work is going on and then we started to talk about the year ahead and, and some new assignments that we might look um, to engage the, the PSEC on. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to note we do have a few new um, PSAC members that you see here um, listed on the slide. Most of them are, are a, a, you know, a change from a, a former member. Um, but we do have two new organizations that have joined the PSAC, so we're now at 42 members. Um, and those two new organizations are the National Volunteer Fire Council, um, as well as NLITS, um, the International Justice and Public Safety Network. So we're, we're pleased to have uh, both of those organizations uh, join the PSAC, and they very quickly um, identified their representatives and, and participated. And I also wanted to mention, actually, on the association front, I almost forgot we had um, in our I think, third association briefing um, on Tuesday, in which we bring together the DC-based staff from the various public safety associations, the PSAC member organizations, as well as a, a few others. Um, and Vicki did a great job, again, uh, pulling that session together. Our executive committee members were there. And again, it's just a good opportunity to kind of give them the latest updates on, on FirstNet um, and talk to them a little bit about how we might work to, to better share information and take advantage of some of their, um, you know, media formats. All right. So if there's not any questions, I'll turn it over to Dave Buchanan. Just one question. Um, uh, when you travel and you talk to public safety, there, if there's a theme about our communication outbound, it's... Um, the lower level people, uh, the street level people aren't hearing this message. And I, and I want to make a statement I want you to agree or disagree or add to it, and that is we have historically uh, in the recent past been focusing on the trade associations and the leadership of these groups mm -hmm. that were really kind of involved in how we stand this up and what it looks like. And we're just now approaching the stage where we start to push that down. Sure. First, we had to know what it was going to look like before we start telling the end user what it was. Uh, would you like to append or amend that in any way? Yeah, no, I think that that's good feedback. And you know, Josh was actually sharing with the EC some of his observations yesterday from um, the engagement that they've been doing with the law enforcement community and really kind of getting at the boots on the ground and, and all the excitement that you see there. And you know, their feedback is, when are we going to get this? Um, so I think, I think you're right, um, you know, that the more we can get at all those different levels, we need to be doing that and kind of arm people. So um, I think his strategy of uh, 
that first phase of outreach was around the national organizations, and then as he's moving into this next phase, kind of hit all of those, you know, working to get into the, the states and some of the urban areas and, and engage with those stakeholders. That's good. Great, thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman, for having me here today. I'm gonna do uh, really two things with you today. One is give you an update on what we've accomplished with state consultation to date. Uh, a little overview of what we've accomplished. And second is give you a preview of what we're planning for 2016. As you noted, Mr. Chairman, a year ago when we came to this meeting, we had uh, accomplished one consultation meeting. In the last 52 weeks, we've completed now 51 more, uh, three more calendared for, for next month. So very, very pleased with the effort we've, we've made to, to reach these states, but probably more importantly, uh, even more pleased with the work that the states have done to, to do this. As I'm sure you can imagine, these consultation meetings aren't just getting a conference room and scheduling a meeting. We asked states to organize themselves around uh, building new governance teams around broadband and around public safety broadband specifically. We asked states to uh, increase the amount of education and outreach they were doing to reach potential users of FirstNet. We asked them to identify the critical issues in their states related to broadband, to use of data, to present those materials and really present to us their most critical needs in their states. And we asked them to build uh, really a coalition or a team that could work together as they prepare to present the FirstNet plan with FirstNet to, to the governor. So they've been very busy, very active, and, and I want to thank all of the single points of contact for the work that they've done uh, to, to help us get to, uh, get to this point. Um, the other thing I would mention uh, while we're on blank white screen here, uh, on, on what we accomplished in 2015 uh, is to mention that also this year we launched our federal consultation program. Uh, the federal consultation uh, started uh, in January. We've reached 12 executive branch agencies. We've had over 75 meetings, uh, individual meetings with those agencies to begin that same process of consulting with federal agencies, understanding their, their needs, desires, and data for, for uh, for their particular agency, building those relationships. Uh, good news is we, we've really been a one-man band. Chris Algiers, our, our, our lead uh, federal liaison, uh, we're adding two more FTEs to help him with that um, activity in 2016 so we can continue to expand that federal consultation. I think that as we close the book on 2015 and start 2016, I think it's important to reflect on I think two, two of our key outcomes from this last year. One was uh, the outreach uh, and relationship building we're able to do uh, with the critical players in the states around public safety broadband and use of data in, in, in those states. And I think you're right, Mr. Chairman, that we really uh, just scratched the surface on that in a lot of ways. FirstNet's been busy at this for a long time. We were obviously heavily engaged in the formal consultation this last year, but we really need to continue that and, and dig in even deeper to reach uh, even more critical audiences as we continue this in, in 2016. Um, the second key outcome was that we asked states and we worked very hard to capture their needs, their desires, and data. We've captured that. We've done, one of the key outcomes from the meetings has been that activity. We also realize we've only scratched the surface on that as well. And as we think ahead to what we're going to do in 2016, we need to continue focusing on, on uh, capturing that information from future users of the network as we as we uh, begin to draft uh, their state plan. So looking ahead to 2016, um, since our last board meeting, our user advocacy team, along with which is outreach and consultation state plans, along with communications to government affairs, uh, met in June to begin our planning for our activities in 2016. And we really the outcomes of that meeting yielded three critical goals, and three goals we're really focusing all of our activities around in 2016. One is to continue to obtain uh, that critical input from a wider range of stakeholders. That consultation activity, you need to continue that uh, and reach a broad array uh, of stakeholders about their needs for the network. Second is preparing governors for their state plan decision, and Rich is gonna talk here in a few minutes more about the work that's going into building those state plans, but the work that's required to really um, lay the groundwork for, for decision by a governor needs to start now uh, and really needs to be organized and, and built in a, in, a, in a strategic way. And third is preparing stakeholders for the adoption and use of the FirstNet network. This activity of uh, educating and forming potential FirstNet users, customers, about the value of FirstNet uh, needs to continue and we'll have a lot of activities that we're uh, <coughs> planning to, to do in 2016 that will help us, help us accomplish that. 
Uh, since that um, meeting in June and since our last board meeting, we've really been focused on organizing our teams around these goals, uh, realigning our staff to better accomplish it, increasing the amount of communication and collaboration across our, our, our disparate parts, um, not making them disparate, but making them a, a really a woven strategy, um, and, uh, and really getting ready to, to launch that operationally, that, that strategic plan to achieve these goals um, here, in, here in 2016. I want to dive in a little bit deeper on uh, what we're planning for the consultation activities. A lot of attention on this in the states. Everybody's interested in uh, what's going to be next for, for consultation. And we've really focused um, our consultation engagement around these, these four uh, critical elements, our critical elements of consultation focus for, for 2016. And these are the areas we think uh, we need to spend most of our time and build our consultation engagements around. The first is around consulting on the critical topics for preparing for the network, the network management and operations activities, uh, topics around prioritization, around public safety grade, around training. Those critical topics help us understand what public safety needs in the network, the management of the network, and the operation of the network. Second is planning for the, the deployment of the network and the data collection that was started this year that concluded uh, yesterday with the state submissions as we continue to work with states uh, to best understand uh, in, in a quantitative way what they, where they need the network, how they need the network to perform, and use that information to help us with planning for the, their state plan will be a key element of our activities for, for 2016. Uh, third is focusing our consultation around the executives uh, who will be making the first net decision. And that would include the governors, the governor's staff, the uh, other key influencers of the governor, including other members of the cabinet like CEO, CIOs, attorneys general, uh, and other key influencers who, who are going to play a critical role to help the governor make a decision about whether to, uh, how to pursue first net in their state. And then fourth, a uh, critical element of FirstNet consultation is, is continuing to share the value of FirstNet and expanding that, that, that value proposition, not just to the groups of folks we've hit, uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, to date, but expanding that to uh, metropolitan areas, to other key uh, constituency organizations and states and key potential uh, FirstNet users who will be, um, who have not yet been exposed to the FirstNet value proposition, who, who we, we want to make sure they're uh, heavily engaged in what we're doing. Uh, we're looking at delivering this in a, in a variety of formats in 2016. We haven't yet settled on the, the final approach, but I can tell you that we're, we're looking at uh, bringing uh, consultation in a, uh, in, in a diverse way with a variety of engagements, targeting around these specific topics to make sure we're bringing the topics to the, to the very best audience, as opposed to what we did in 2015, which is more of a sort of a, a, a one meeting for, for lots of people I see multiple engagements to bring the very best people to the topics that are necessary. We're going to use next week's um, SPOC meeting uh, to share this information with them, to get their feedback. We don't want to proceed with a uh, plan for 2016 consultation until we've gotten their feedback, until we've socialized this plan with them, uh, and we'll, we'll work then with the, the FirstNet leadership team to finalize that uh, at the end of, end, of next, end of this month. So if any questions, happy to answer them. And I'll turn it back to Amanda otherwise. I, I do have a question, or I guess an encouragement, and that is, and I've said this before, um, under your first column, you have current uses of broadband and public safety. And I think that's important to take a look at what people are doing now. But um, you know, I will constantly cry out, current broadband does not support a lot of applications that we would otherwise be using, which is why we invented this thing. Um, and so we always need to be asking the question, what would you do if you had a safe, reliable, secure broadband network that you can't do today? And I think, you know, we've certainly been informed by NIPSTIC and um, those efforts, and, and that's great. But we just sort of need to keep that, that voice in the back of our heads, too. I appreciate that. That's a good nuance over what's written here. And I think we would uh, strive to do that in our engagements with the states and stakeholders. Appreciate that comment. Thank you. Anything further for Amanda or Dave? Thank you, Dave. Well, as we get closer to the release of the RFP in December, uh, state plans become an ever more critical topic of discussion. We have Rich Reed here today, who, uh, who is in charge of that initiative for FirstNet. Rich? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to brief the committee on our current thoughts to, around state planning. I always feel bad when I get separated from my colleagues because uh, we're all user advocacy. We all work together and we work together very closely to interact with stakeholders. Most of you know that I've been working and my team's been working closely with Dave and preparing and de uh, deploying those, those initial consultation meetings. But in addition, We've been working closely with all the divisions within FirstNet. We work closely with Jeff Bratcher's team, the legal team, the business planning team, and the acquisition team, because ultimately, all of those processes result in a, a, an implementable and executable state plan. So we work very, very closely with all the divisions within FirstNet to ensure that we're getting the correct information into the acquisition uh, process so that it results in the information we need to deliver that state plan. Um, I'd like to uh, just spend a few minutes giving you a, a, a quick overview of what we think a, a state plan is. So it really depends on your perspective. So we know that the, the statute requires three basic elements to, to comprise a state plan. Essentially, we have to notify the governor that we've completed the acquisition process. We, it's the statute states that we have to provide details on that plan. And we also have to provide the, the monetary or fiscal impact to the state. Um, for example, how much a grant would be worth through the NTIA uh, if the state were to choose to apply for that. The state, on the other hand, has a very different perspective. They want the most detail possible. They would like the most information possible in that resulting state plan. But we have some limitations, and, and those limitations are revolves specifically around the information that gets provided through that acquisition. So we have to be very conscientious about asking the right questions in that acquisition to hope that it nets the results and the detail of information that's going to satisfy that, that state's desires. So in addition to the information that gets provided through that acquisition, we're also going to develop some information specifically through our own processes. So I, I would envision the fact that the CTO organization would would provide individual elements that they believe to be appropriate for that state plan. I'm sure the legal team will put in terms and conditions and things that are specifically appropriate for FirstNet to include in that state plan. So we'll be you know, generating our own sort of information that goes into the state plan as well as looking for that bidder and acquisition process to provide us the information. There's a, a fourth perspective that we need to consider and that is the, the information needed for our federal partners to evaluate a potential opt-out decision or when a state takes on the responsibility of deploying their own radio access network. So there has to be sufficient detail in that state plan that allows NTIA and the FCC to do their statutory requirements. So the state plan looks very, very different depending on the perspective that you have. Any questions on that? So, we looked at how to best deliver the information in a state plan. I think there's been a, 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 a belief system, um, at least I assume there's a belief system, that we were going to end up delivering the state plan information in a traditional paper format. Um, we've also looked at PowerPoint formats and an interactive online portal. And we looked at it through the lens of time, speed to delivery, cost of delivery, securing that information, understanding that delivering a, a paper document, having it lay around on someone's desk or not be properly secured with the sensitivity of information that would be included in that state plan might be problematic. There's also the issue of specific vendor sensitivity. So uh, the, the potential partners may have limitations of what information they would want to release to uh, any level of entity that could view that state plan. So controlling access to sensitive information also seems to be pragmatic. The ability to disseminate information is always difficult with a paper plan, ensuring who gets the right version in the right hands. We also have an issue of version control and access control, uh, all problematic under a paper plan. Understanding that the federal partners are gonna have to evaluate counter proposals potentially, and doing that with a paper process seems to be complex and, and problematic. Um, and ultimately, it's just not how our competitors do business. And we're going to have to understand that the way the folks we're going to be um, competing against in this marketplace interact with their stakeholder communities electronically. So we believe that it's really important that we have an online portal to interact with our stakeholders, both from a, a, a purchasing standpoint, so 
identifying ways to sell to our customer base. And it seems uh, you know, reasonable and, and uh, it seems like the best way to deliver the content, especially content that changed regularly is through an online portal. And ensuring that we have that single point of update and the ability to provide not just a state perspective, but a nationwide perspective fairly easy through an online portal is the most pragmatic and cost effective way to do business. And, and Rich should still be complying with the law in terms of delivering the plan to the governor, right? That's correct. You can deliver an electronic product. Absolutely. We would envision developing an executive summary and an online <coughs> access, you know, a, a username and password for that governor or governor staff to, to get to the controlled information, understanding that, you know, the, the general practitioner and stakeholder would want to enter into the public site and view device information, coverage information, and service information, just like you would if you went into, you know, purchase any mobile data service. So as I mentioned, I talked to and briefed the FirstNet leadership and they concur that an online portal is the best way to, to deliver this information to not only the governor staff, but practitioners in general, all of our stakeholders who would end up purchasing FirstNet services. Uh, we've also realized that to, to reflect the desires of a, of, of a state and to, to really document the information that, that's been provided to us through consultation that we're going to have to take the information that Dave's teams have, have generated and documented through all their interactions and make sure that information is reflected in that state plan process. Um, yesterday, we had the deadline for our data collection. And to date, just to, to let everyone know, we've had 43 submissions uh, from states. We've been notified by three additional states to, to say they would have it into us by the end of today. So that takes us up to 46, and we expect three additions based on communications we've had in the next few days. So that puts us at 49 state submissions, which is really quite good. We also have a handful of federal agencies that have submitted us data. So the point of that is we have to now take that information that's been provided, and we need to do a, a measure of analysis. We're going to need to, to look at the both quality and quantity of data, look for any gaps, and normalize that information so that we can be assured that the information we're providing, uh, the acquisition and the, the, the potential bidders, that they have the most uh, you know, highest quality of information uh, that reflects the state's desires. Uh, my team and I traveled out to the CTO uh, group in Boulder and, and had a, a, a really a robust meeting around what elements that should go into the, the state plan. So my team has worked to develop a, a, a state plan data template. So it's essentially a paper document that outlines the, the types of information we would like to show on a state plan. But I wanted to ensure that the CTO organization supported it, agreed that we could achieve that through the acquisition, and if we could not achieve that through the acquisition, that they would be responsible for developing that information. And uh, we had a, a really robust dialogue. We all came to agreement on the elements that were important to include in the state plan. And we also went through the exercise to make sure that the folks who were responsible for pro providing that information understand that they would be considered the sources of that information. And we've also developed a, a source matrix where we, uh, you know, not only identify the point of contact that would be responsible for developing that information, but we're also going to document the, 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 the type and um, format of that information so nobody's surprised when it comes time to deliver it. Um, lastly, we're engaged, as I mentioned earlier, in, in meetings with the FCC and the NTIA to ensure that everybody understands the appropriateness and the, the roles that they're going to play sort of post-acquisition in that, that, that state plan approval process. Um, we really need to really understand not only the process that the FCC and NTIA are going to follow, but the timelines associated with that, uh, pro the process that they're statutorily obligated to implement. Some of the elements that we think are appropriate is obviously the information that the state's provided us in consultation, any federal input that, that we've received that outlines the, the desires that we, we see to, uh, to, to um, service that federal customer base. Uh, of course, coverage is the, the, the most important topic that we hear in consultation. So how we're going to um, show the states not just band 14 coverage, but any other coverage, deployable coverage, how we're going to uh, uh, you know, achieve 
providing service to, to that state is going to be critical for us to be able to, to map in some type of online portal. Public safety grade recommendations, not just from the, the, the PSAC who has been working on public safety grade, but also the information we receive through consultation. How we're going to do network operations, identifying the state decision process that we achieved through consultation, device strategies, roadmaps, and support for those devices, applications, both, both core and third-party applications that we would be considering or, or sharing on that portal, how we're going to do network operations, deployables, what the approach to in-building coverage could be, um, and obviously the most important thing, the financial components, uh, how much service would cost, how much devices would cost, that sort of thing. So as we talked about in the next slide here, in 15, you know, we've really been working in this pre-RFP scenario, really trying to provide the most up-to-date information to the acquisition. My team is now looking post-award. What does the state plan development process look like? What do we do to get to the governor's decision point? And then beyond that, post-implementation. So that's going to be our focus in FY16. If there's no questions, that's all I have. Thanks, Rich. Any questions for uh, Rich? Hearing none, thank you very much, Rich. Great, great work. Thanks. Uh, appreciate how open the process has been, too, in terms of listening, taking in all the inputs. It's not a simple issue to solve. It, it, it is not. Yeah, it is not. With that, Uzama, I believe the floor is yours. Uh, so similar to this morning, I wanted to just inform everyone that the, the substance of the meeting is over now, and the, the board is going to be talking about some legal items um, um, in a closed session. However, I wanted you to be aware that the, the, the items that are going to be discussed today will be discussed publicly tomorrow, and there will be presentations on those topics. Um, but I wanted everyone to be aware that we're going to be disconnecting from, from the board meeting now. So at this point, do I have a motion to close the meeting? We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Any abstentions? At this point, we'll close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>